everyone. This meeting is being recorded. Welcome to our uh, remote online notarization discussion. We'll also have some in-person notarization conversation as well regarding the new laws here in New York. I appreciate your all coming and I certainly appreciate this panel of experts who graciously agreed to come on and talk to us a little bit. A few housekeeping tips. We'll leave the chat open. You're certainly welcome to converse or share information amongst yourselves. If you have any questions, I ask that you put them in the Q&A. We'll try to get to as many as possible at the end of the conversation. Whatever we don't get to, we'll be sure to forward out that information afterward uh, for your review. So I would like to go ahead and introduce our panel. We have Christopher Holtzman. He is the VP of uh, Corporate Underwriting, First American Title. Brian Webster, the president of Notary Cam. Tim Reininger, he is the uh, digital counsel for eNotary Log. And Bill Anderson, VP of Government Affairs from the National Notary Association. If you don't know me, I'm Marcy Tiberio. I am the president of uh, Professional Notary Services and the founder of the New York Notary Alliance. So welcome all again. We're gonna get right to it because I know we have a lot of material to cover. So Tim, can you start us off and let us know what exactly is RON? How does that differ from IPEN or in-person electronic notarization and traditional notarization? Sure, thank you, Marcy, and for inviting me to this panel and uh, thank you for everyone for being here. So uh, remote online notarization, as it's generally called, is uh, simply from a legal perspective, the use of communication technology to invoke the legal authority of a notary as a public officer. And so uh, up to this point, traditionally, that authority could only be invoked in a physical presence. And in past times, there were some who had hoped maybe a use of a telephone would be enough and all that. And that was clearly rejected by uh, legal authorities and, and others over the years as being totally unreliable. But now the use of audio video component, which is two way live, is uh, has been deemed by you know, all the states at this point as sufficient to invoke the authority of the notary as a public officer. Now, just to your also a quick question, that there, there's confusion about this as to you know, is this only for electronic documents only? Can it be for paper documents? And if the Virginia approach, the first approach contemplated that, you know, you got to use audio video and technology. It's going to be, you're going to want to use electronic documents and records and signatures. But uh, starting with Montana, and uh, you know, there are there some use cases coming up. And people still wanted as their, let's think about it as your product, your product. Whatever your legal situation, if the product needs to be, usually because of the relying parties, still has to be a paper document, the RON can accommodate that. You now, there's a lot of flexibility to suit your, the various legal needs of your clients, uh, in your situation. And, uh, and I, I'm sure Chris will touch on it later. The land title has got taken made a great efforts had great success with allowing even you can paper out an electronically signed document and that will be able to be recorded. So you have lots of flexibility. By the way, IPEN is the in-person use of a, a signing of electronic record document. That is classically, uh, you know, the, the signer still in person in the same room with a notary in front of our computer performing in the Terrell Act. That you know, went back to what the East Sign Uita laws, 1999, 2000, and the New York version of it. And it had relatively little traction over the years, but there are still use cases for it. And you're, as you'll learn, the New York law also authorizes that. So you all in New York are, have great flexibility. You, know, you have a lot of ways to strategically leverage this law. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And what is the legal precedent behind allowing a notary in one state to notarize a document for an individual in another? So the uh, all of the 
state enactments of, of the wrong laws expressly authorize that that the cider could be anywhere physically outside the United States with uh, you know some requirements put into that you know that's a special case you know you can have your client on a business trip in Germany or England and they can still you can still perform with your New York notary a a rough run so that has been allowed you know we probably will touch on uh, you know this has been controversial from the beginning it was very hard for people back 2011 to conceptualize the idea of you know when the legal system is so wedded to physical presence physical jurisdiction and all of a sudden now the signer could be anywhere but you know the whole legal system has struggled with cyberspace in general you know jurisdiction of the courts you know and tax matters this and that and so we have as in the notary world also enjoying this fray in a very interesting way and i've been seeing less and less questioning about that you know we will get to some of the issues around where is notary physically and the, the new york law expressly requires the notary to be physically in new york Great, thank you. So Bill, tell us a little bit about what the requirements are to become an e-notary in New York. Thank you, Marcy, for inviting me to be with you today. Greetings from the West Coast, um, Los Angeles. Uh, according to the statute uh, in Executive Law 135C and the new regulations that were just um, published last week, um, you must be a commissioned notary to register to become an electronic notary. And you have to uh, go through a registration process uh, where you apply to become uh, an e-notary. This is not a separate commission, it's registration. Um, and there's a $60 registration fee that uh, you must pay. And in your registration, you're required to describe the electronic technology or technologies that you're going to be using to perform electronic notarizations. Uh, you must also provide a sample of your electronic signature uh, using your selected signature vendor um, that you describe in the registration. Uh, the signature that you use must include your name and any instructions, authorizations, or techniques that allow the electronic signature to be read and verified. For example, if you use a digital certificate, next 509 digital certificate to sign your name as a notary, you would have to provide the public key of your private public key pair of the digital certificate uh, so that the Department of State can read it. And then finally, upon reappointment uh, of your notary commission, uh, uh, when you reapply and you want to continue to be a, an e-notary, you must provide verification of the accuracy of all information on file with the Secretary of State. And then you must also confirm or affirm that you are in compliance with Part 182 of, of the regulations. Now, Bill and I, you talked, we talked a little bit about this before jumping on here, but this e-commission is not just for remote online notarization, is that correct? But uh, yes, uh, Marcy, it's a good question. Um, from the regulations, if you read the regulations and the statute, it sounds like it's talking only about uh, remote notarization. And you know, the word electronic notarization in the regulation is essentially defined as a remote notarization. But uh, the Department of State has informed me that if you only want to perform in-person electronic notarizations and not remote notarizations, or if you want to perform both uh, an IPIN and a RON, you must register to become an e-notary. And that was not the case previous now, so that's an important piece as well. I know that there's been some conversation about what happens to your original com uh, commission. Are there two separate commissions? We actually confirmed this morning that once you receive that e-commission, that is your commission, your commission number, your renewal. 
your traditional commission number goes away. So you'll want to make sure that moving forward, you use that e-commission number that was given to you for your stamp, both for in-person electronic, RON, and in-person traditional. If at any time you decide at the end of your commission, you don't want to renew that electronic commission, you would need to apply for additional. I know it's been a little confusing, so I appreciate the information we got from the division of like this morning. And thank you, Bill, to, for clarifying that information. Tim, talk to me a little bit about the platform requirements for Ron and a little bit about the VPN that seems to be an, an issue, the location piece for notaries. Sure. And since I'm not a technologist, I'm certainly let, you know, hope that Brian jumps in if there's free to. <laughs> but the uh, the platform providers bear a lot of responsibility here, you know, and so if number one, any notary, I don't care if you're at a big law firm day or something, you're going to want to get a good uh, third party run vendor to work with. You're not going to want to have your IT people just build it in house or something like that. And, you know, the, you know, there are the, certainly a few matters of the requirements, things to credential providers will provide the uh, the secure two-way live uh, capability audio video signing process. You'll have issues of maybe uh, multiple signers that come up and I think all the top providers accommodate multiple signers. Uh, you know there are I know that in your, your corporate settings you're going to have a lot of situations of uh, multiple signers and complex signings signers multiple places so uh, notary cam and others will accommodate that, but you'll have those issues around with the signing, document management, and the audio video capabilities. But now also uh, the credential service provider aspect. And I think when Ron started, and in many states, you know, there are third party providers out there. They could be LexisNexis with knowledge based questioning. We'll get into some of these things. There are entities, Jumio, others that do credential analysis, get into that. Uh, it, but, uh, you know, in terms of uh, what I see, especially with New York here, referencing, I think, for the first time in a state law, a credential service provider, and New York is tracking where the federal government is going with these things. I would say the platform providers are going to be, a good one is going to be also providing that service or have that capability. And, uh, the liability issues, so forth, that go around that. So, uh, then finally, Bill Anderson alluded to this. You know, you always have to have the ability to authenticate the notary. So, legally down the road, and this gets missed in a lot of states and others, you know, there's a basic evidentiary issue here. You know, the notary is put in this key position, but you can't have a lot of it doesn't have security and requirements around what the notary is doing with the sealed signature. New York does that. So you have a great law around these issues. And uh, Bill alluded to the, you know, the terms of art there, the digital certificate of AI. So the Ron vendor needs to be able to also accommodate that. Thank you. And then I'm gonna go right to Brian because that VPN issue sort of relates to our next question is, you know, where is everyone in this transaction? Where can the notary be? Where can the signer be? How does that, you know, affect this VPN? Or why is the conversation so important around the VPN? Why does it matter? Yeah, uh, thanks, Marcy. And, and you know, Tim kind of alluded to this uh, a few moments ago. And, you know, as it, as it relates to kind of physical location, that's the beauty of, of the remote online notarization and the technology, right? So, the, the mm -hmm. signer has far more flexibility in where they can be physically located compared to the notary. Um, you know, Tim even used examples of, you know, someone on a business trip in Germany, right? They can be almost anywhere in the world, you know, outside of the United States. You know, we have a client where all of their customers are international signers. It's not in real estate. Um, but that's their business model, right? And so we're able to accommodate that uh, through our platform. You know, the 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 notary doesn't have nearly as much flexibility, 
right? So the notary is required to be physically located and conduct their duties within the state in which the notary is commissioned. So you like within, within the pandemic, um, we had a few of our notaries that were like, I'm going to go to Florida for a month on vacation. Can I continue to, you know, notarize documents? And we're like, sorry, you, you, you can't, right? Because of, because of those restrictions that are on the notary. And, and, and that makes total sense, right? You know, the, the secretary of state and the state's you know, issue these commissions and control the actions and duties of, of the notary. And all of that pertains to laws dictated by the state. You know, Tim, you mentioned, you know, um, you know, typically it's been defined by physical location and boundaries. And so, you know, that's really kind of what dictates uh, what the notary is able to do and where they're able to do that. So just to clarify the VPN, the issue with that is that it it hides or changes the location of the notary, correct? Am I understanding this correctly? So it's not evidently apparent that I'm in New York doing a run. If I were to use a VPN, it could show me in Texas or Ohio. Is, is that, am I correct in saying that? Um, yes. And I'm not a technology person, so I throw that out there. <laughs> You know, it, it it could, right? And part of the responsibility of, of the vendor is tracking, you know, the IP addresses and the locations of of all of the parties, right? And so, you know, if if a notary or signer is using a VPN, they can mask kind of where they're located. Um, you know, that goes back and falls on the responsibilities um, of the notary in order to, you know, they're commissioned in the state, they are licensed, and, you know, they have the requirements and duties in order to follow the laws in which they've received their commission. And, and one of those is to be physically located in the state. And so that is, you know, part of their, you know, ethical duty in order to be able to, um, you know, reside within the state in which they're commissioned. Great, thank you for that information. Um, so Chris, tell me a little bit about the fee per notarization. What can notaries charge? Sure, for a traditional paper in-person notarization, uh, I don't believe the fees changed uh, with updated regulations in the statute, but for an electronic notarial act, the notary is able to charge $25 per electronic notarial act is what the updated regulations say. And the regulation, if I'm correct, says it's an all-inclusive fee. So the notary can't charge additionally for storage of the recording or didn't say that it's it says 25 all hours. Fee, yes. Perfect. Yes. So Tim, tell me how will someone know if a document was notarized by Ron? Do we need anything additionally added to the document, verbiage? How will they know? What do we need to do as notaries? Yeah, that it's uh, it'll be very easy. The all of the states now, including New York, require that the notarial certificate include language to that effect. That the, you know, in some of the states prescribe exactly the language, but it has to be in so many words that the this material act was performed, <clears throat> the personal appearance was fulfilled by use of communications technology, by means of communications technology. The, uh, this has been uh, an issue over the years. The, the original law in Virginia did not require that because the view was that, you know, not frankly, not to cast this radical, but it kind of it was a natural evolution of the notary office and so forth, but it became controversial and quickly uh, friends in the, in the land title industry and banking wanted to know if something had been notarized with use of online notarization. So anyway, now that's been cleared and it's very easy to know. In fact, I think it's gonna go the other way that there's so much more security and reliability around the RON process that I think the uh, relying parties are gonna to wanna to see that, that if that's, that process is used. Thank you. So Brian, it's just some general housekeeping is if this, signer is in one place and the notary is in the other, what is the venue for our notarial act? Yeah, so um, that uh, uh, gets a little, I don't want to say tricky, but 
um, comes into in, into play in the conversations quite a bit, right? As Tim, as Tim kind of alluded to, you know, there really isn't a venue for for these type of transactions, right? It, it's all done virtually. You know, uh, Tim mentioned that each state um, or majority or all the states now require that that statement gets applied to the documents that it was conducted remotely via auto communicate audio video communication technology. And so since it's being done that way, it's 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 a virtual setting. So there's no physical venue. Um, but the reason why you want to look at the venue, you know, is is what are the applicable laws that govern the transaction? Um, and Tim, Bill, Chris, you guys are legal experts. So, you know, please, you know, correct me if I if I, you know, uh, misspeak here, but, you know, uh, it's really kind of pertaining to kind of the laws that dictate the transaction, right? And so, you know, first and foremost is going to be the um, state in which the notary is commissioned, right? Those are going to dictate the requirements of the notary and the duties of the notary. Um, it can also depend upon the state in which the documents are being recorded, um, even down to the county level, right? So like with First American and, and Chris for real estate transactions, you know, that's going to depend on, on the property state uh, in, in which it's located. So there's going to be laws govern the transfer of real property uh, and the recording and, and making public these type of documents pertaining to real estate transactions divided by the state and county. So when you're looking at kind of from a Ron transaction, you have to look at a few different areas to ensure that you are taking into account all the applicable laws and regulations that kind of define that transaction. You know, for us as a vendor, you know, we have our legal counsel that advises us on that. But especially on real estate transactions, you know, we, you know, lean very heavily on our title underwriter partners, right? And so if, if Chris at First American says, we'll ensure the transaction, that gives us the confidence that they are ensuring the transaction and feel like that what we're doing and what our notaries are doing are adhering to the laws applicable to this specific transaction and vice versa. If they want to ensure it, then, then we need to make sure that, that uh, you know, we meet, make the necessary adjustments or changes in order to make sure that this is an insurable transaction. You know, but this gets back to kind of, I think, a very, very valid question and, and a similar question that comes up quite often, especially as we talk about, you know, technology and, and innovation, you know, whether it applies to Ron or, e-closings or, or an e-signing or, or even buying a car online, you know, you know, human nature is to apply the existing paradigm that's been around for decades to anything that new that comes along, right? Like it's new. I'm going to hit it with a stick until I understand it. Um, you know, it, it's, it's human nature. And, and like I said, completely understandable. And I've been guilty of doing things like that, but you know, as an industry, you know, and if we can get over that hurdle um, to to look at these new capabilities independently and understand how we can take them and apply them to to our various business models, you know, we'll we'll begin to see that accelerated adoption, um, you know, of innovation that other industries have experienced and really real estate and, and especially, you know, mortgage and title have really been left out of. Thank you. And how about the date? If I'm in one time zone and my signer is in the other, what date we reflect on our documents? Um, for us, it's the date, the time where the, the signer is located. That's what we capture within our, our system. So like I said, with our international transactions, it's gonna be based on, um, on where the signer is located. Uh, and even in, within state, you can have variations within the time zones. And we always capture that based on, you know, like I said, the, the location of, of the signer and the execution of those documents. I'm going to throw that out to anyone else if they want to add something to that or. Well, if the, uh, if the notary, you know, we're going to talk later about record keeping um, and the, the journal requirement that we will talk later about requires the notary to record uh, the date and approximate time of the notarial act. And that would, I take it, would be the time to the notary. 
Um, so uh, uh, while um, the system may record the, the signer's date, um, the notary would want to record the date where they are located. So to be clear on that, Bill, absolutely correct. So within our platform, we do capture both, right? And so within the audit log and what we're looking at not, is not just the signer's uh, date, time, and location, but within the notary journal, we do that. We capture that uh, specific time and date from, from the notary's perspective as well. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that information. Yeah. No, Marcy, if I could jump in. I think oh, for, sure. yeah, I just remember from the, the small amount of time I spent in a corporate practice, you know, the, the great stress in the law firm when there was a big closing, you know, closing of a deal and the timing of signatures and yeah, it'd be very stressful. So I, I'm curious from, from Chris's perspective, uh, closings of real estate when the, I mentioned the many times with the date, you know, closing has to be done by a certain date and all that stuff. You know, it, do you, how do you all approach this issue of the signers being in maybe in a different day, you know, their time zone, you know, the, the notary? It, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I too have uh, experienced that the the stress, stresses of getting a closing done and, and wire deadlines, cutoffs, moving money, et cetera. Um, I think one of the things that I always emphasize to my people in these scenarios, especially because in the grand scheme of things, Ron is so so much, I don't want to say in its infancy because I think it's certainly been accelerated and we're getting close to that point where eventually it'll scale uh, much longer, uh, reach that tipping point. But one of the big things that I tell all my people is we, we need a little bit of time because I think the process, it's not just us as, as industry experts and people who live and breathe this every day. It's how do we convey that to our customers, manage their expectations and make sure that they're going to have a good customer experience. The same way I want the customers and these signers to have a good experience while being safe and secure. I know, you know, Brian does, everybody does. We, we all want that. Um, that's in everybody's interest to have a good signing experience. So a lot of times when we have the more complex scenarios, it's about we need a little bit of lead time, making sure we're educating our customer with some of the process. Some of the some of the things that have come up, things that having lived and breathed this every day for the past few years, I wouldn't necessarily think about where you're working on a closing. And this usually isn't the complex transaction, but more so it's an accommodation. Somebody's traveling overseas and they won't be back in time to do a closing. Um, a lot of it's about managing the expectations. Do you have the right internet speed? I mean, simple things like that. You got to make sure you have a, a camera or a, a computer with a webcam. Things like that. That's you know, I, I guess I, they kind of fly over my head sometimes because you're so in, in the weeds. Are really important to manage your customers' expectations, whether that's a big corporate client and it's complex transaction, or you know, just a, a residential refinance transaction. Wh whatever you're dealing with. I think that's key. And I do think we will get to the day where this just becomes a normal habit. And it's, okay, this is a Ron transaction. We need less lead time because not only do we as a title company, uh, you know, the, the Ron vendors, but also our customers understand the process. They know what they need to do. And, and I think that'll go a long way in accelerating Ron in general. Thank you everyone so much for that information. I'm going to switch gears a little bit because within this uh, remote online notarization regulation situation, there are some traditional notarization changes that have been made that I think are very important. So I'm going to throw this over to Bill. Tell me a little bit about the new um, identification requirements because previously in New York, we didn't have any standards and now we do. Yes, this was um, interesting when the regulations were published, uh, at least I was expecting uh, remote only regulations, but um, there were uh, several provisions that were also added to the rules that apply to all traditional notarizations. One of them ha happens to deal with identification. Um, uh, previously, I believe the real property law was really the only statute that said that the notary must, uh, in taking an acknowledgement, must be uh, has satisfactory evidence of the identity of the signer, and that's where it stopped. Um, there were no other rules. But with the uh, new regulations in Part 182, they ex expressly state, in general, three ways you can identify someone with identification documents, 
by the notary's personal knowledge of the signer and through witnesses. So let me go through those a little bit with more detail. With regard to ID documents, there's two options, okay? Um, the first and the best, frankly, uh, is that the signer must present front and back one government issued ID by a government agency that meets four requirements. Number one, it's current and valid. Two, it has the bearer's photograph. Uh, three, it has the bearer's signature. And if applicable, uh, an accurate physical description of uh, the signer. So if the ID has a physical description, it's got to match the signer. So one ID that meets that, okay? But uh, the regulations also say, if not, you can have the signer produce at least two uh, identification documents issued by an institution, business, uh, entity, or federal or state government with at least the individual signature. So under that requirement, a social security card would meet the requirement because it's got a signature and it's issued by a federal government. Um, uh, maybe a, uh, a university ID card with a signature or even a library card could po possibly meet a credit card with a signature, okay? But we would recommend that you always use the first method, one uh, ID front and back of a government issued ID with those four elements. Okay, so that's ID documents. Uh, number two is your personal knowledge of the signer. Uh, you've always been able to do that. And you'll be able to continue to do that. But thirdly, it also says you can use a witness or witnesses. Um, and so the rule says that you can use one witness who swears or affirms the identity of the signer who is known both to the notary and to the signer. Uh, now, in, the, in today's world, that's probably not going to happen a lot unless you live in a really small town. So the regulation allows the use of two witnesses who swear or affirm the identity of the signer. And in this case, they won't know the notary personally. So the regulation says they have to provide an ID from that first type of ID documents, front and back of an ID issued by a government agency that is current or valid, has the bearer signature, uh, photograph, and if applicable, accurate physical description. Now, do we need to identify the witnesses as well? Do we need to verify their ID? Do you need to verify their, I'm sorry? Their identification for a witness. Do we need to verify they are who they are? Uh, yes. In, in, well, in the case of two witnesses, you do. They have to actually present that ID front and back of uh, an ID issued by a government agency because the notary is not going to know them, okay? Um, uh, but if you use one witness and they're personally known to the notary, then that is sufficient. Perfect. Thank you. So then we'll switch back over to Ron. Ryan, can you talk to us a little bit about the identification requirements when conducting a RON notarization? Yeah, certainly, right. And so, uh, you know, Bill hit on, you know, two of the ways that that you know a notary can can verify the identity is through, you know, personally known to the notary, right? So that's always going to be the case, right? And even within our platform, we allow the notary to, you know, attest to that and and acknowledge the fact that they, you know, personally know uh, know the signers. But when it comes to an instance where, you know, the notary doesn't know the signer, which is probably 99.9% .9 of the transactions, uh, states are require what they refer to as MFA or multi-factor authentication. And that is using two separate independent methodologies in order to verify and validate the identity of the signer. Um, the most common forms that you see um, defined and in use today is through credential analysis and KBA or knowledge-based authentication. So on the credential analysis, that's typically the first component. Um, the, uh, the vendor, the platform will ask the, the signer, the principal to scan or take a picture of the front and back of, of their ID. 
And it requires the exact same kind of criteria for the ID that Bill had kind of referenced for the, the in-person verification, right? So it has to be a, a an unexpired current, you know, government issued ID, you know, picture, signature, description, um, all of those requirements have to be met for the use of that ID. Uh, the vendor will take the, the scanned image. Um, it will evaluate the ID for authenticity. Um, it'll look at specific features of the ID to ensure that it is not fraudulent. Um, and, you know, it'll look at things like the edges. You know, does it have an edge? Does it not have an edge? Is there peeling? Uh, along the edge of, of the ID. All of those are kind of factors that, that lead into um, the evaluation and the results of the credential analysis vendor. You know, we, we've had conversations where we've gone to the vendor and say, can you share exactly what you look at? And they, they don't, it's all kind of black box to them. It's very proprietary, kind of that algorithm that they use as a competitive advantage. Um, the last piece that the credential analysis vendor will do is that you know, they've scanned the back of the ID, which has a barcode, right? If you look at your driver's license, you've got that barcode. That barcode uh, in MRZ, a machine readable zone, it contains data as well. And the vendors will compare the data from the barcode and compare it to the data on the front of the ID. You know, legitimate IDs, those should match. And so it'll make that comparison to ensure that what's presented on the front of the ID it is the same as the data presented within, within the barcode on the back. Uh, the second piece of the multi-factor authentication around the KBAs is these are kind of out of wallet questions, right? That come from you know, various data sources, but the most common data source used is, is credit repositories, your credit report data. Um, that's why typically, you know, a signer will need a U.S.-based social security number in order to be able to produce uh, and run the KBA, KBA test. A uh, KBA uh, vendor, Tim, you mentioned it earlier, LexisNexis uh, is one that provides a lot of these services. They will generate five questions based on that credit data from the signer. Uh, the signer will have two minutes to go through and, and answer those questions. And I believe that, you know, a lot of the states define within the, um, the regulations that they have to answer four out of five uh, of the questions correctly within those two minutes. They do get a second chance if they fail the first time. Um, but if they're able to pass that, that would be considered, you know, the two separate forms of identity verification to, to, for the signer. I want to throw this out here, but I know we didn't talk about it. From anyone's understanding, are biometrics allowed in New York State under the new regulation? Do we know? In New York? In New York. I think the, it, to answer that, it's would they be allowed as an add on service? For example, if Notary Cam performed credential analysis and KBA. And then on top of it, also offered a service of biometric comparison that might be permissible. I don't think it's clear whether that would be a permissible alternative. Okay, we'll certainly look into that. I'm asking more along the lines of so the individual not have a, you know, United, they're not a U.S. citizen, right? Some states allow for biometrics that's recently come up. So we'll certainly get more information. Yeah, definitely. you know, some states explicitly mention, some yeah. states um, don't and and. You know, it all depends on kind of what the state state legislation is. You know, some require KBA, some don't. Some mention biometrics, some don't. You know, it 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 as Chris said, it can be very murky, right? Okay. So as you know, as a vendor, as I mentioned before, right, like especially on a real estate transaction, you know, because of the various stakeholders uh, on that transaction, like with the title underwriters. You know, we go back and we coordinate and we lean very heavily on our title underwriting partners, those that are insuring the transactions, mm -hmm. to get their kind of legal opinion of, as far as what is allowed and, and what's not allowed. What are their requirements as far as, you know, identity proofing for this particular transaction and what they're comfortable with? 
Um, and so that's really kind of how we we are approaching it, you know, as as a vendor for both the software, but also as as providing the the RON services as well. Great, thank you. So, Chris, Marcy, regarding I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just want to jump in. I'm just you know, this is a another great issue. I I would say that you know New York. It's going to be controversial with some, but I think it's a great opportunity for New York, this idea of the tying to federal standards, which are evolving, but this reference there to a level two and all that. And I know that, you know, if the law firms up there, if you were to take a new lawyer and ask in their first week to go figure this out, you know, can we do biometric? The lawyer will probably quit. You know, it's very tricky, but your best to you interview the, you know, RON providers. Who are provide you know ask they they perform the uh, do the credential service provider function, and uh, if you're a law firm or a company and say look, we have clients in China, or Brazil. Do you accommodate this? And some of the RON providers probably will say we don't, you know, or they'll figure it out in some fashion. But you know the that the you know leave it to the credential service provider to figure out getting to the L two. You could have a whole seminar on this, by the way, the concepts of federated identity. You know, this goes, you know, th this is the, to me, the most exciting way, uh, the most aspect of Ron. You know, now we're leveraging, we're getting into this whole world of identity in cyberspace and all the evolving solutions. You know, we didn't have access to any of this in the paper world, of course. And so, so I, you know, and they do reference biometrics. Yeah, that's a different story. You know, the other question would be, you know, if your law firm is dealing, let's say, with First American, and First American says we won't underwrite, then you don't do it. You know, or others would, whatever. So you got this interplay of what will our, what are our business, what will our lying parties accept? What can the wrong provider do? And that will inform, you know, hopefully your wrong provider will give you the maximum options for all this. But the, I just wanted use that term of art federation is big here and you know the even the federal government like the gsa now is that what they'll say is they'll call it uh, we need vouching witnesses you know it's all a system of you know if the federation someone else has already identity proof somebody in person and they can vouch for that entity and they can share the attributes and get to all the technical stuff so I just want people to, I don't want people to come away from this discussion feeling really nervous about this law and how they're going to do it. In fact, they should, it should be the opposite. They should be excited about the uh, numbers of strategic ways they can leverage this for their clients. Yeah, and, and I'll just add, I think that's only going to continue to develop in, in the near term. Yeah, and, you know, this is, you know, I'll, I'll, probably shouldn't venture down this path, but I will. Um, you know, this is a personal opinion and not an opinion of my employer or anybody like that. But, you know, as Tim is alluding to this, right, um, you know, it, it, innovation is going to continue to evolve as far as like, how, how are we able to identify, you know, a consumer and, and validate the identity of someone, you know, with with the majority of, of the state legislation that specifies the methods in which you know uh, the notary or the participants must be identified really kind of you know uh, hinders our ability to to look at new and innovative ways or could potentially far more accurate methods of identifying who a consumer is right and there's several people within the industry and, and friends and colleagues that are that are looking at this challenge uh, to try to come up with, you know, better, more accurate, more reliable um, methodologies in order to be able to, to you know, identify these, these signers. And so I'm excited about the future of this, right? You know, just like, just like Tim and, and Chris are, you know, and, uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunities uh, in the near future for this and for these capabilities. Great. Thank you. So Chris, as we talk about these new ways to identify signers, let's talk about that as it relates to real estate and mortgages. I mean, is that something that we think, oh yes, you can use a, a witness now, or yes, personal appearance is okay, or 
be sticking with, hey, you need to use government issued ID? So it's a great question. You know, Bill went through all the different uh, methods. I, I, I'll say on one hand, I think that's a good thing because the, the reference in the statute of just satisfactory evidence of ID leaves a lot of things, which mo much of the notarial law does, leaves it within the discretion of the notary. I think it's very useful that the state put out a list of, of different methods to try and, you know, at least get some parameters around it and have some consistency. I think that's a, a huge positive. Uh, like Bill, my, my strong preference in every case would be valid current government issued ID. Um, I, I do see... I think title companies are going to look at this individually and make a determination of whether or not they feel comfortable. But I think facts and circumstances matter. Um, if we have just thinking about how real estate closings go in New York and you send a title closer in there and you have, um, you know, the title closers done hundreds of closings, there's going to be real estate attorneys who have done hundreds of closings. I don't think that it's going to be, you know, obviously personal personal knowledge won't be uh, a significant percentage of notarizations that are done but i think it could happen and i think a lawyer for their customer for the client it it's very much could happen um where they've worked with them they feel comfortable they have that personal knowledge now remember they have to make an attestation themselves that they do personally know them so there is a little skin in the game there you know it shouldn't just be willy-nilly yeah i personally know them i i met them five minutes ago there do have to be some parameters around that but I don't want to say it's going to be impossible to happen. The witnesses, I think, will be a little uh, less common. Certainly a witness who, who actually knows the notary and the signer, it, it very well could happen, especially in uh, smaller towns, as someone pointed out. But I, I don't think it's going to be the most common way. Where I could see witnesses coming up uh, is, now remember that government-issued ID has to be valid and current. So if your ID just expired, that could be a situation um, but it, but what I would say is if you're presented with these situations, it would be uh, prudent to contact your title company uh, to see whether they're going to be comfortable with that uh, in the end. Yeah. And let me just kind of piggyback on that, if that's OK, Marcy, you know, to, to Chris's examples, <clears throat> like with a credible witness. You know, we require the use of a government issued ID. Right. And so, you know, driver's license or whatever it is even for a credible witness. So if for some reason we can't get the signer to pass KBAs or, or they don't have a social security number and the title underwriter is authorized the use of a credible witness, they've gone through the evaluation of who the credible witness is and the relationship and kind of done that kind of fact-based determination. Uh, we then require the credible witness to go through the exact same identity proofing methodologies as the signer would. So credential analysis with government issue, unexpired ID, KBAs, right? Because, you know, we're relying upon the identity of the credible witness to attest to the identity of the signer. So we need to make sure that, you know, they pass all of the appropriate requirements as well. Great, thank you for that information. So I'm gonna transition over once again to traditional in-person notarization. And now we have journal requirements. Is that correct, Bill? Can you tell us a little bit about the journal, journal requirements here for notaries in New York State? Yes, this was another um, surprise when the rules for comment were published and then the rules were finally adopted. They, uh, section 182.9 uh, requires records to be kept. And, um, here is basically what the stat, you know, what the rule says. Number one, that all notaries must keep records. Uh, from how I read that, there are no exemptions. So if you're an Thank attorney you. and a notary, you have to keep records. Um, you know, uh, so as long as you're a notary public uh, and have a commission, you have to keep records. Secondly, you have to keep them for both traditional and electronic notarial acts. Okay, and, and that's important uh, on the RON side because you also have to keep a recording, but you also must keep a journal on top of that. Um, now, the regulations don't get into the format of the journal. Does it have to be a paper journal or can it be electronic? Okay, we do know by inference in reading the regulation that records can't be electronic because uh, notaries can have a third party repository store the record as long as they are password protected. 
uh, or protected by another secure method of access. And that typically would apply to an electronic uh, uh, record. Um, the rules uh, specify the information that must be included in the journal uh, or the records that a notary keeps, the date, approximate time, and type of notarial act, the name and address of the individuals for whom the notarial act is performed, the number and type of notarial services provided, the type of credential that was used to identify the person, uh, and um, the verification procedures used for personal appearance. So, you know, if, if the person appeared in front of you personally, uh, you would basically, you know, you'd point to the ID uh, credential that was, um, that was uh, provided. Also with regard to the records, uh, whichever you keep, a, a paper or an electronic journal, the regulations are clear that you must be able to produce those for the Department of State uh, or for anyone else uh, as necessary. Uh, and these records must be kept for at least 10 years. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, Marcy, you can keep your records in a repository uh, under certain circumstances. Um, and that would specifically apply, I think, to electronic journal records, uh, although there may be repositories as well for paper journals as well. If I could just add something uh, really quick, Marcy, and just it, it's a kind of a personal aside. Uh, my my mother-in-law has been a New York notary for a long time. She's done a lot of real estate closings. And when she saw the journal requirement, she, you know, knowing that I've, I've worked in this space, just kind of looked at me frustrated, like, are you serious? And I, and I had to explain to her, and I can understand that because, you know, she's been doing closings for, I don't want to say how long, but a while. And she, um, you know, she's never had to do, there's never been a strict requirement. And what I explained to her was that's to your benefit as a notary. You know, you provide such an important role and there are a lot of bad people out there trying to find ways to dupe the system. And as something, you know, Tim alluded to earlier, it's a little bit more challenging to dupe somebody using a, a Ron vendor. Um, that's kind of challenging, but some of these fraudsters, the different schemes you see where they're finding um, an actual document that's been recorded in the public records with the notary seal on it, and then duplicating that, having a journal protects you there. If, if somebody comes to you and says, did you notarize this deed? You know, we, we think it's a fraud uh, on this date and time. You can just look at your journal and say, no, you didn't. And, and that protects you. And I just want to point that because I can understand that it becomes somewhat of a bur you know, somewhat burdensome, but it's there to protect you ultimately, I would say. And to add to that, I want to say, you know, it's to protect the consumer, right? The signer as well. It's not just to protect you as the notary. Sure. We really want to make sure, uh, especially in New York, where Thank we you have, for that clarification. It goes yeah, both some, ways. some higher incidences of deed fraud, right? We hear all about it in the news. We've seen it, that this is an important piece of the puzzle. But Bill, I want to talk a little bit about the actual pieces of the journal because I think there's a little confusion. We are not to uh, log any sort of identifiable information, right? We're not writing down their driver's license numbers or their passport number. We're not keeping a copy of that ID that is not what we're putting in our journal. Is that correct? Yeah, it, that's correct, Marcy. The, 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 the rule only requires that you indicate the type of credential uh, that you use, driver's license, passport, um, you know, uh, a, a green card or whatever the ID you use, but not any of the uh, PII that might be uh, included on it. Yep, Stuart, from Fort for everybody to remember that, and you would definitely want to keep your journal secure, correct? Locked yes. in a desk drawer or a safe or someplace where not everyone has access to it. Yeah, and 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 we see that in the, the regulation where, you know, uh, in the use of repositories. Um, it says you can use a repository as long as your records are password protected. You know, they don't want the repository to get the records and do what they want with those records. These are password protected, so only the notary can get at them, okay? The, the repository just stores them. It's the notary who's the gatekeeper. Great. And while it doesn't define an actual journal, I just want to reach out, are we talking about, can I just use a loose leaf piece of paper? Does it have to be a bound journal, a spiral? Like, is there a best practice for keeping a certain type of journal? 
Right, that the, the regulation doesn't really say, okay, but but professional practice would, I think, strongly suggest that if you use a paper journal, it should be bound um, uh, and uh, it should be uh, commercially printed with information that is typical for recording uh, journal information. There are a lot of journals on the market that could be used. Um, and they all um, they all are bound, and that would be the best the best practice recommendation for paper journals. And then I have one last journal question. So the regs look like it says I just need to confirm how many oaths I gave to that individual or how many acknowledgments I took. Is that correct, or do we need to list each individual document that we've notarized in that transaction? Well, it says that you have to. Uh, indicate the number of services um, and the um, the number and type of notarial services provided. Okay, again, professional practice. Think about you know Chris was mentioning about the value of the journal. Okay, if this is going to happen, if this is going to be used in a legal dispute, they're going to want the journal to be very clear and plain. Okay, so. We certainly would recommend you keep a separate line in your journal for each notarial act you perform. You complete it in full because people are going to have to read that and you want to make it plain on its face uh, what information is there so it can be valuable uh, to the parties requesting it. Great. Thank you so much. Chris, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Let's talk about recording documents in the state of New York, right? This is going to be an interesting uh, thing for notaries and county clerks. What do yeah. we know? What do we need to know? So we're in a good place is what I'll start with. Uh, the way the statute's drafted, it, it's going to be very helpful. It's going to prevent some of the log jams that could come up. Um, so so uh, we're in a good place is the, is the key here. So I'll start to record these documents. Let's just uh, keep in mind the basic premise. We always need to be recording original documents. So how do we have e-recording? It's because by statute, the statute says you can uh, scan in a paper wet sign document uh, and submit that for recording. Now, not everybody in the world can e-record. It's generally usually a few people and how do the counties um, protect themselves? How do we protect the integrity of the public records? We have that person do a certification that they're uh, in physical possession of the original documents. But how does that work in the electronic world? Well, in the electronic world, uh, a document executed and notarized via RON would be an original in electronic format. So our first preference would be to e-record the document. And, and this comes up all the time. Well, after the document's been fully executed, I pulled it from you know, Notary Cam's platform. Do I print it out and then scan it to go uh, submit it for e-recording? Because that's what I do in you know the, the paper world. And the answer is no, you wouldn't need to convert that to paper. Um, that's one of the benefits um, of RON, of electronic documents generally, you're cutting out and reducing uh, paper. So you would your first you know, answer would be go to e-record that document. Um, now, not every county has e-recording. Um, so what do you do if you're in a jurisdiction without e-recording? Does that mean you can't do RON? The answer is no. Uh, luckily, um, New York, uh, the legislator fully recognized some of the, the practical limitations that are on the ground where not every county has e-recording. And so they created this concept of papering out. And papering out is really just, again, it's a statutory process, the same way e-recording um, is authorized by statute. Papering out is authorized by statute. And in New York, it allows the notary public, um, first, they're going to look at that electronic document, verify that no security features on the document indicate that it's been altered since it was signed and notarized. And then you're going to print that out, print out that electronic document on, into paper form, and then attach a certificate where you're, uh, the notary certifying that that uh, paper printout is a true and correct copy of the electronic version. Then that printed out electronic document together with the certification is entitled to be recorded in the public records. And in New York, some states left a little bit of discretion to the uh, counties, but in New York, um, and this was something advocated for by the land title, uh, we really pushed to have the city and the, the city, excuse me, the city register and the county clerks 
are required to accept a papered out document uh, as long as it would otherwise be entitled to be recorded. It's got to meet those, of course, recording requirements, uh, margins, document size, et cetera. Um, but that's going to be huge. That's going to allow um, you to effectively do RON in every um, county in the state. Just for some perspective, when the RON law got passed in, in Texas in, I believe, 2018, there was about 70 counties that did e-recording out of like 250. And the legislature had to come back and adopt the papering out law so we could then, you know, offer RON in the entire state rather than just those large metro areas. Because it's it's important for people in small rural areas where notary services aren't exactly easier to easy to find all the time. So uh, that's gonna that's gonna be very helpful in New York. Just for everybody's benefit, this certification is called a certificate of authenticity, and um, that is actually located within the statute. For anybody who's interested, um, the reference is, the citation is uh, Executive Law Section One Thirty Five dash C subsection six. And that's, that makes it much easier for everybody, all the notaries working on this, because you don't have to say, well, what do I have to say in the certification? What does it have to read? It's right there in the statute. You can pull it and it'll make your life much easier uh, to be able to use and rely on that. Great. And just so for everyone's information, you can charge $2 for preparing that uh, statute of um, that certificate of authenticity if you so choose yeah. to. I'll add no, one, uh, one other thing. Oh. I'm sorry. I, I meant yeah. to say. So this question comes up very frequently. Um, do I have to be the same notary that performed the RON who is papering out? And if you look at the statute and the regulations, any uh, you have to be commissioned as an electronic notary public to perform RON, but any notary public is authorized to paper out that document. So the, the way the statute reads, it's a notary public. So it doesn't have to be the same notary who performed the wrong. That that comes up pretty often. I figured I'd throw it out there. Tim. I just want to interject here before our time runs out to everyone. Now, you know, obviously uh, notarial acts go way beyond real estate. They involve many subjects. But, you know, to my knowledge, there's no group out there lousily banging down the doors about how to do bills of exchange, demand letters and protests, all that stuff, like in the first 100 years of our country. It's, so yeah, really great credit goes to Chris and First American and then the New York Land Title Association for being there really the, uh, the powerful voice in getting this law in New York and in other states. And that's why you know, it certainly is, you naturally their view is, uh, land title purposes and how to minimize their risks and all that. But it, you know, I think all of us have benefited from that. So I think you know, I do want to publicly thank Chris and his First American team for their efforts. And I think we all should recognize them for that in New York. Well, th thank you, Tim. It takes a village. It really is a group. And to flesh everything out, it's, it's really, you know, legislatures, we could talk all day, but if people don't conceptualize and see things by getting a demo of a platform or understanding some of the mechanics, they're never going to get things passed. So I think it really was a group team effort. And you're right, it, it extends far beyond real estate, um, even if we were the Land Title Association was uh, pushing. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for your efforts. We have a couple more questions, and I know we're a little over time, but Bill, can you tell me what the circumstances would be when a notary could refuse a notarization? There's been some, uh, you know, chatter about, well, I don't want to keep a journal anymore, so I'm just going to only notarize for who I want to and not for anyone else. Is that, is that, can we do that? Can we just choose who we notarize for and who we don't? Well, if we look at the regulations again, the regulations um, say that a notary must refuse under circumstance, certain circumstances. And there are, uh, is a regulation that says they may refuse under certain circumstances. Okay, so according to the regulation, you must refuse to notarize if any requirement in part 182 is not met. Okay, this is very broad. So for example, if a signer doesn't appear before the notary, you must refuse. Uh, if um, you can't satisfactorily identify the notary, according to the regulation, you must refuse. Uh, or if the signer will not take an oath or affirmation, if the notarial act requires one, you have to refuse, all right? 
So uh, you also must refuse, according to the regulations, um, if the, if you as a notary is not are not satisfied that a the official or a presented record uh, evidencing the individual's capacity to act as a representative on the record for notarization, if you're not satisfied with that. So for example, if you're a signer is an attorney, in fact, representing uh, someone, um, and they produce a power of attorney that names them as the attorney, in fact, um, you have to be satisfied that that document says that they have the, the right to, to notarize, okay? So those are when you must refuse, okay? Now, the regulation goes on to say you may refuse under two circumstances. One, if you're not satisfied that the signer is competent or has the capacity to ex execute the record. So if the person is not there mentally uh, or is not sufficiently aware of what's going on uh, to as a notary, you may refuse. And secondly, you may refuse if you're not satisfied that the signature is voluntarily made. So if in that notarial act, there are people in the room who are uh, coercing the signer or pressuring the signer to sign, and the signer is waffling, you can put the brakes on the notarization and refuse. Excellent, thank you. So, Ryan, let's talk about RON platforms. So there are lots of RON platforms out there currently, right? And we get questions all the time. Uh, let me start by asking, you know, I've heard, can I still do this by Zoom and do my own, like figure out my own identity credentialing or KBE? It would be very difficult to not use a, a RON platform and do this on your own, correct? Almost impossible is my understanding. Am I correct in saying it? Uh, I would say yes. Okay. Um, and, you know, primarily, and, you know, we can, we can lean on, on Tim and Chris on this too, right. Is, you know, you have stakeholders, uh, within the transaction that's going to have minimal requirements. And typically those are going to be, you know, certain certifications, the vendor can meet certain standards, um, uh, credential analysis and so on and so forth. So, you know, leveraging zoom and, and, you know, recording with your phone probably won't meet those, those requirements. But in terms of finding a reputable RON platform, because there are so many today, right? And we get this question all the time. What is New York State? You know, is there a list? There's not a list. We, they certainly are, you know, regulations or requirements yep. that New York State has for technology. But what should we be asking? Like, how do we vet these platforms to make sure they're compliant for New York, they're reputable, and that they work well for our business model? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So there, there's a few... Uh, resources that uh, are available today. Um, for those that are familiar with, you know, mortgage and real estate, you have the trade association referred to as MISMO, M-I-S-M-O, MISMO.org. So MISMO is a standards and certification body. Uh, they are kind of an offset of MBA, the Mortgage Bankers Association. So currently right now, I think there's 26 or 28 um, RON vendors that have been certified by MISMO. So MISMO defines minimum standards for RON vendors, ensuring that they're meeting kind of an agreed upon um, minimum requirements that meet both kind of the state requirements as well as kind of industry best practices. So each vendor goes through an initial assessment and certification process and then an annual recertification. Um, actually, we just submitted our paperwork to MISMO uh, just yesterday to renew our, our certification. Some states, not all, but some states have a list of approved uh, RON providers, right? So where I'm located in Maryland, uh, the Maryland Secretary of State ha has that has a list. Uh, not all states and not all you know, SOS offices uh, do that as well. Another location that you can look at is through kind of title underwriters. So uh, many of the title underwriters or all the title underwriters will have a list of kind of approved preferred partners, right? And in that category, 
you know, it can list dozens of categories, but one of the categories is going to be, you know, an e-close vendor or a RON vendor. Um, and what that indicates is that, you know, these vendors have worked directly with the underwriters, the underwriters have reviewed uh, the RON vendor, reviewed their, you know, information security standards, their technology, their process, all of their requirements to ensure that it will meet what the, the minimum standards that the that underwriter has. So, you know, looking across those three categories can give give you a good sense of, you know, a, a reputable organization as far as the vendors are concerned, because you have these third parties that have evaluated and looked at them on their own. Um, but selecting a vendor, you know, out of 28 or more can be, you know, very, very daunting, right? So, you know, the first question really to ask is what type of service are you, are you looking for, right? Majority of the RON vendors out there are software providers, right? And so, you know, for a typical notary or a signing organization, they need a software vendor, right? And so you can look at the broad range of vendors out there that provide the RON platform, you know, as a licensed software, software as a service. Uh, depending upon your organization, you may be looking for notarial services, right? So not only do you need the technology, but you need the, you know, approved RON notaries to be able to conduct the transaction yourself. There's a few vendors out there that not only they provide the software, they also have notaries either on staff or a pool of approved notaries that the transaction can come through and they will use that platform to conduct those notarial services uh, themselves. Tim. <laughs> Tim. Just, you know, just to add to that. So what Brian say, so here's an example of mm -hmm. going back to your, the, your audience here of law firms, let's take that example or large companies based in New York, you're gonna have offices all over the country probably and probably other countries. So now you look at this strategically, you have a few different ways you can go. And I, I've been involved in such discussions with you know, Fortune 100 companies. You know, you could uh, maybe now uh, use a notaries in New York to handle all of the material needs for your branch offices in other states. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to sit there thinking, how am I going to have Ohio notaries, this and that, and let's pick on Ohio, but, you know, you could now have New York notaries, you could have no notaries in-house and outsource it to like notary camera, someone who's going to handle that part of it, you know, or some combination. So mm -hmm. this does <clears throat> mean for a lot of law firms, probably for the first time in their history, there's going to be the subject of notaries at their board meetings with the partners, you know, it was some business strategy part of it. I know that's happened in Fortune 100 companies. And this, from the notary perspective out there, I know because Bill Anderson, I mean, Mark, Mark Aronson is in the crowd of the Pennsylvania Association of Notaries, the senior people in the notary world. This is unbelievably exciting situation. I, you know, I, I doubt in the paper world, the subject of notaries ever got to the agenda of a law for a management committee. Yeah, very similar. You know, prior to joining Notary Cam, I was at, you know, a, a mortgage lender and, you know, um, our principal, the owner, had relocated to Florida for some reason. Um, right. And and as an owner of the company, you know, had to notarize documents on a regular basis. Right. And so uh, we as an organization had implemented kind of our in-house notary with with the technology from a RON vendor in order to be able to to still you know notarize all of those documents. All right. That's a that's a great use case. Um, the last thing that I'll I'll kind of hit on, we were talking about the journal. Uh, right. And so as you're looking at at features and functionalities of these vendors, right? You know, Bill, you talked about kind of using a repository or a proxy in order to be able to store your journal. Um, so talk to the vendors about, you know, do they store the journal? How do they store the journal? Is it accessible? Is it protected? And the last piece is the the video recording, right? So does the vendor record the restore the video for you? You know, is it part of the fee? Is there additional fees for that? Is it, you know, accessible to you? Do you have to download it and store it yourself? You know, are they using kind of MERS or that type of repository? So, 
you know, there's there's several options out there. So it really just kind of depends on what your needs are um, to investigate kind of the best vendor that's going uh, to provide the best solution for you. Great. And it's certainly important to ask questions like if I leave your platform, do I take this with me? Do you keep it? What's the charge? And ultimately, I want to remind everyone that you are responsible for your journal as notaries. So whether you use electronic or paper, it's part of this bond piece. Ultimately, you need to have access to it in case the Secretary of State needs access. And you need to make sure that it's retained for the length of time that New York State requires you to those full 10 years. And so, so I'm going to wrap up. Oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, Brian. So real quick with that, with that, so like with us, you know, if a, if a notary leaves our platform and they're, you know, retaining their state license, um, you know, we still retain all of the recordings in the journal and everything like that. You know, we, we've had situations where a notary will move and, and move to a different state and they need to take that with them or they need to turn it back into the state depending upon the state in which they're located, right? And so those are all great examples of things to look out for as you're, as you're finding these partners. Absolutely important information to make sure you get. So I'm going to ask this one last question. We'll take two quick questions and then we'll wrap up because I know we've gone over, but uh, this Tim is directed toward you, but certainly anyone can jump. And also, you know, New York State is sort of at the tail end of states who approve run. So I guess in our regard, great, the kinks have been worked out in other places, but what challenges do you, uh, you know, have other states overcome in this? And what do you think will be challenged, if anything, for New York State to, you know, adopt these regulations and move forward with Ron? Well, um, I think that um, states have, you know, there are only like six or so states left that have not enacted remote. And um, there have been uh, discussions in many of these enactments on the question of interstate recognition of notarial acts across state borders. Uh, fortunately, in at least the states that have enacted the uh, Ron, they've, they've worked that out and they've pretty much kept existing law intact. Um, in, the, in the states that remain, that remains a big issue uh, and, and perhaps even a barrier to uh, enactment um, that will have to be worked out. It's very important that notarized documents be recognized across state borders uh, to help our economy uh, thrive uh, and to protect everybody's interests. Does anyone have anything they want to add to that? Okay, take a couple quick questions. Oh, Tim, go ahead. Well, I, you know, two quick things. There, there, there is a, I'm a, a camp of lawyers who see that historically that the material acts have full faith and credit to include the electronic and all of that, but that has been a subject of uh, you know, some debate and discussion, all that. But you know, the up to this point, no, there have been no rejections of an online notarization at all, and certainly none based on interstate recognition and lack of full faith and credit. There just hasn't even been a challenge. And you know, they've been probably I don't know, hundreds of thousands or millions of these up to this point since 2011, but. The other thing is really the, the biggest challenge with Ron, when we were doing the Virginia law, first discussion, and I think it will always be the case, what we alluded to is the identification of the signer, you know, and the evolving technologies of that. And that is a global issue for sure. We're in it. You know, we, some of us, in, certainly in New York, probably hearing discussions of the, the idea of a digital central bank currency, you know, all, all this push for digital everything which puts more and more pressure on digital identities. And that's got to impact us and the, you know, the technologies that notaries be using. We also have, I know Bill Anderson working on mobile driver's licenses, you know, that will great way to achieve L2, for example, you know, with under the federal requirements. So I think identity will continue to be probably the greatest challenge in evolving, uh, opportunity. Great. So just a couple of quick questions. 
again, the exemption, my understanding is there's no exemption to these regulations for, uh, you know, attorneys that everyone must apply for their e-commission and they're required to keep that journal. Is that, is that correct, Bill? Am I right in saying that? Yeah, I, you know, the, the, the term used is a notary public. So if you are a notary public and, you know, uh, attorneys in New York, uh, I believe, must be commissioned. Um, so that would apply to you. Uh, somebody in the chat talked about commissioners of deeds. You know, they want to know if, if these rules applied to commissioners. Uh, commissioners of deeds are another uh, office uh, with limited notarial powers. Um, and I don't, to, to, to that question, I, again, the term is notary public. They don't use the term commissioner of deeds. So, uh, I, you know, uh, Tim and, and Chris, you may have uh, ideas on this, but I would just say that that just applies to notaries. Okay. I, I would tend to agree. Uh, commissioners of deeds are somewhat unique as well uh, because historically they've had the authority to go outside the state and, and notarize documents, which wouldn't necessarily jive with the uh, notary needs to be physically in New York when performing the notarization. And I know we, we touched on this briefly before, but we'll, oh, go ahead, Tim. You know, I, I, that's, I, I should have made that point. I want to emphasize that point again about, you know, for, and for Chris, especially the heartburn of, you know, you, I'm sure you have a lot of uh, professionals, notaries living in New York that would then go out and, you know, New Haven or Greenwich for the weekend where they live, so forth. And then those do the notarial acts there. That's not just a, a simple defect that, you know, can be corrected and all that. That gets back to the basic jurisdiction. You have no jurisdiction operating out of Connecticut. Therefore, the act is invalid. That's it. And so poor Chris is going to have a case probably in a bankruptcy court or so forth. The easiest thing for this, if somehow a trust, bankruptcy trustee can say that was an invalid act. Because you did it in Connecticut. You didn't have jurisdiction. It's just like a, a divorce court. This has happened. Issuing a divorce decree, a judge, well, there's no full faith and credit if that judge didn't have the proper jurisdiction over the parties of the case. So you, know, you cannot stress enough to the New York notaries, you must not violate that rule about performing physically while you're in New York. You're right, Tim. That is something I, I worry about. I don't know that others do, but I do. Um, and the way I always tell our people is this prevents it, you being physically in New York or your commissioning state prevents all these thorny jurisdictional issues. We just don't want to have to deal with them. <laughs> Wonderful. So most of the rest of the questions pertain to specific platforms and things like that. Um, we will continue to follow up with uh, Division of Licensing and get information out. We will certainly go through and answer any questions uh, directly with you that we weren't able to answer today. I know everyone's time is valuable. And so we're gonna wrap up. I'd like to thank the panelists truly for taking time out of your day to do this. I know it's been a little confusing and your expertise was very helpful. The information was valuable. So thank you so much for joining us. And everyone who attended, I commend you for wanting to know more about uh, these new laws so that we all do the right thing, both protect you as a notary and the consumer as well. So thank you all so much on behalf of PNS and you know the New York Notary Alliance. We will certainly be in touch going forward to do more events like this, but thank you all. I hope you have a great day and I appreciate you all once again. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Marcy, for having thank us. Everyone. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.